Well, it's, uh, let me have you turn to Daniel 9, Daniel 9, first of all, and uh, that's on page 893 in the uh, Pew Bible. If you're going to grab that one, I'd encourage you, if you didn't bring a Bible, to do that so that you can follow along. And we are, uh, you know, we gather, if you're visiting with us, we are people who have found forgiveness and cleansing in the blood of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that we just sang about. And uh, we're no different than you in that we all came from various, I mean, every kind of background here, but we have found Christ. And if any man's in Christ, that man, woman, boy, or girl is a new creature. We've been born into his family. So we rejoice and we love to sing about his blood. In fact, last night at the wedding, as they were, uh, I think it was as they were lighting the unity candle, they were singing about the blood of Jesus Christ. And I thought, wow, what, a, what an appropriate way to begin your life together, you know. And uh, this was a great week of prayer. Uh, I think we have perhaps the most prayed for high school retreat of all time going on right now. I mean, and when Gary just mentioned in prayer that there's 30, wouldn't, what would you give to have 30 20-something-year-olds mentoring your teenagers? And we've got that. Praise God. Uh, the 30 of them, the ratio's good up there. They're going to have time to hang out with the students and pray, continue to pray. They'll be coming back Monday, or yeah, tomorrow. So pray that this... 72 hours or whatever it is would be a, a wonderful, wonderful time for the high school retreat. When we gathered uh, Friday morning, uh, one of the many different prayer times, but uh, to pray with the elders over in the coffee corner, uh, it was a great time. It really was. And uh, I was thrilled, actually, at the end of that time, uh, we'd been praying all week for David and Julie Hamilton to be here, uh, to get here safely, and for their time here to be a rich time of connection with us as they come in from China. And just at the end of the time, David walked in, and uh, he was uh, fresh off. He was on jet lag is what he was. <laughs> His family was trying to sleep, but he was wide awake, and so he came down to us right here on campus. I love it that they could live here. And uh, that's another answer to prayer that we should give thanks for, that we have that kind of situation. But anyway, we had a great time with David. And one of the guys that was praying at the elder time gave thanks for the last Friday because uh, we gathered Friday at 5.30 as elders every week, pray. And I, I was thinking, did we do that last week with these guys? And then I remembered the no excuses. A couple hundred guys prayed together. And so much has happened, I'd almost forgotten. But I got to tell you, it has been a great week, and uh, I'm excited. Last week, you know, we looked at the truth that we don't know how to pray as we should. But we can pray with confidence because the Holy Spirit takes our weak, frail, imperfect, inadequate groanings, and he groans with us and brings him before the throne in perfection. God the Spirit interceding with God the Father on our behalf. And two weeks ago, as we begin this year with uh, reigniting this theme that we didn't need to reignite, just kind of fan the flame, of abiding, abide. Two weeks ago, I described it and defined it and then gave eight practical tips on how to abide, and we only got through four of them. And uh, as we were thinking about this week, I'm going to mirror image that message on this matter of abiding in prayer. Abiding in prayer. We're going to define it, describe it, and then I'm going to give four uh, practical tips on how to abide in prayer. So that's kind of where we're going uh, Daniel 9, as you know, uh, we have been abiding in uh, the book since we've had this project going since September 7th, and it's growing. 
Uh, got an email today from a guy that said, I just started the 30-day challenge. I can't thank you enough. And that kind of thing is happening. I know it's continuing to grow. Hundreds of us are thoroughly enjoying this. And uh, if you've been with us this week, we've looked at Nehemiah's prayer in ni- ninth chapter of Nehemiah, Daniel's prayer in the ninth of Daniel, and then up through this morning, John 17, Jesus' prayer. Three great prayers of the Scripture that we've been abiding in. And I want to just read these first seven verses of uh, Daniel 9. Lord, we are so thankful that we can come into your presence in Jesus' name and ask you to speak to us through your word now. Thankful that you wrote down prayers of men and women and they can be patterns for us and so give us eyes to see we pray in Jesus name amen in the first year of Darius the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans Babylon Daniel had been there quite a while And Nebuchadnezzar and his son and his grandson had Israel under their heel. And then God said he's going to raise up the Medes and Persians, and he did. And Darius came in, the Mede. Well, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Daniel was reading Jeremiah, chapter 25, and he realized there's 70 years that we're going to be under Babylonian, and the 70 years were almost over. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keeps his, keep his commandments, we have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us, open shame. Now, uh, it might surprise you because maybe you have this image of Daniel as a young kid. He was a young kid (laughs) when the Babylonian captivity took place, when he was yanked out of his home and brought to serve in the Babylonian court. Uh, He was young, you know, teenager probably. But maybe you have that picture in your mind of him in the lion's den. Now, this prayer is probably prayed before the lion's den because Darius is the guy that threw him in the lion's den. So the book of Daniel doesn't unfold in chronological order necessarily, but uh, this is a great prayer. And I know you enjoyed it, as I did, as we just lived in it for a few days, along with Nehemiah's prayer and Jesus' prayer in John 17. And it has a great answer. Uh, Verse 20 of this chapter while I was speaking and praying, God answered, you know. And he sent Gabriel. I mean, think about it. We've just celebrated Elizabeth and Zacharias. Gabriel showed up to announce. Gabriel showed up to tell Mary, you're going to have a child. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. Well, Gabriel came in answer to Daniel's prayer. The angel and announced the most specific prophecy of Messiah, dated when he would come, when he would be cut off. It's an amazing end to the chapter. 
And by the way, the Bible is all about Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christos, Jesus Christ, and that he'd be cut off. The Old and New Testament underline that when God's Son came to this earth, he died on a cross by the hands of wicked men, but God gave his Son. And again, I tell you, that's why we celebrate. That's who we're all about. And if you're new with us, oh, I hope you'll come to understand that, that Jesus Christ, God's Son, died in our place. But anyway, it's one of the most amazing prophecies uh, in the Old Testament. And so I wanted us to read this prayer and think on it just a bit. And like I said, I want to do what I did last time, or two weeks ago, just define and describe abiding in prayer a bit, and then give four practical tips on how to abide in prayer. Because as we've said, the week of prayer isn't over. I mean, the designated week, but we pray that we would abide in God's Word, not just for a season, but for a lifetime. Well, I pray that we will abide in prayer, not just for a week, but for a lifetime. And uh, let me give you three thoughts on defining it and describing it. First of all, prayer is rooted in the character of God. He does listen to our prayers. He does hear them. He does answer them. He does, yes, desire to hear from us. He wants to hear from us. I mean, prayer is rooted in the very character of God. Look at verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and said, Alas, O Lord, the great an awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness. If he says there's going to be 70 years in Babylon, there will be. And if he says he's going to return and restore us, he will. Verse 7, righteousness belongs to you, O Lord. Oh, I can pray because God is righteous. Verse 9, to the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness. I can pray because he's not only righteous, he's compassionate and forgiving. Righteousness is founded, rooted in the character of God. Nehemiah's prayer, same thing. Uh, I won't take the time to go there. Nehemiah 9, you saw it. And if you didn't, boy, let me encourage you. If you haven't been abiding uh, in, with this project, writing the scripture, Take these three prayers, Nehemiah 9, Daniel 9, and John 17. Start this week and uh, write them out. Slow down and listen to them and think because you'll see the character of God. When Jesus prayed, we're on holy ground. And in verse 11, I think it is, he says, Oh, holy Father. And in verse 25, Oh, righteous Father. Even the Son of God, when he prayed, it was rooted in the very character of God. Secondly, somebody says to me, yeah, okay, it's rooted in the character of God, but define it for me. What is it? Prayer is to seek him. Ultimately, Prayer is to spend time. It's to give attention to your creator. Look at verse 3 of Daniel's prayer. I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication. Literally, I set my face to seek him. The ESV, I turn to him. I turn my face to him. The, some of the other translations say turned, and th that's true, and it's a, okay, but the, it, it's a stronger term. I set my face. I turn to the Lord with all my attention. I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him. Yes, prayer involves praise, verse 4. You know, he's praising the Lord. Uh, 
Yes, it involves confession. Verse 5, we've committed sin. We've sinned and committed. We haven't listened to your word. We've gone our own way. I mean, if you can't pray the prayer of Daniel 9, Nehemiah 9, the confession prayer, I don't think your eyes are open. When we come before the righteous God, and as a country, as Americans, as a church, as an individual, oh, Lord, I've sinned. Yeah, so it involves praise. It involves confession. It involves requests. Notice, I sought the Lord by prayer and supplication, verse 3. And you'll see, Daniel has requests. It involves these things, but ultimately, though we can ask, seek, knock, and we should, ultimately, I would say, it is to seek communion with him. It is to give your attention to him. And then thirdly, he wants us to. Abiding in prayer, living, continuing, staying in prayer. He wants us to. He desires us to pray without stopping. That's what he said in that First Thessalonians 5. Pray without ceasing. Don't ever quit praying. He wants us to pray. Um... Uh, we're in a spiritual battle, Ephesians 6. And he says, for this reason, pray at all times in the Spirit. Pray at all times. Don't stop. God wants us to live, abide, stay, continue. Me know in prayer. Abide in prayer. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried and fretting. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, what? Pray. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. Philippians 4, verse 6. And verse 7 promises the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. When you give things over to the Lord, when you seek his face, when you abide in prayer, there's this peace that comes in that you can't fully explain. It surpasses comprehension. Now, he wants us to. And uh, Jesus told the whole parable, Luke 18. We had a great time just being exhorted by that. Uh, over in the gym, and no excuses morning, a couple hundred of us in there. And Gary opened up Luke 18 for us, where Jesus told the whole story to say that we ought to continue and not lose heart in prayer. Continue praying. So he wants us to. Interestingly enough, by the way, I, uh, I looked for this phrase because I'm speaking about what? Abiding in prayer, staying, continuing, living in prayer. And it fits so well with the start of our year as we think about the two-way communion. We listen to him, and, he, and then we, he, he hears us. He'll listen to us. But I, used the, I looked, and I, you know, of all the times he uses abide, and it's so common in the New Testament, it's such a central term, and I told you about the nine prefixed abides where he uses prepositions to strengthen the term, I only found one time, and this is just a sidebar. I don't know why I'm telling you this, really. But now you're listening. Only one time when he says, abide in prayer. And it's the widows. He says, we should take care of widows, especially those who are widows indeed. Remember that? In 1 Timothy 5. And in verse 5, he says, I'll tell you who a real widow is, a widow indeed, one who really senses her desolation. Like Mike was saying, a church that prays is one that's desperate, you know. Well, a, a widow who is a widow indeed continues, prosmeno, in entreaties and supplications and prayers all the time. And I thought, what a great illustration for us to sense our need and to pray. And the fact that he doesn't say the term, you can see it all through Scripture. And in fact, what it's underlining for us and why I did bring it up that I only found it one time in that phraseology is that to abide in prayer is to abide in Him. It's to seek Him. It's to have communion with Him. It's to set your face to know Him. And so when Jesus says, abide in me and my words abide in you, and you can ask whatever you want, he's saying, abide in me, I'm the vine, spend time with me. Okay, so that's really all I wanted to share 
about abiding, or at least all I've got time for. Let me give you four practical tips on uh, how to abide in prayer. And they're just four of many, uh, and I'm not telling you they're the most important ones. They're things that I've found helpful. And I don't know about you, but any time I can get some help in this matter of abiding in his word and in prayer, I want to listen up. And when people tell me what has helped them, I listen. And so let me give you four thoughts, and I'm not sure I would rank them as the top four in my life, but they've been very helpful to me, and I hope they might help you. First of all, begin with the Word. Begin with the Word. Did you notice that's where Daniel started? Look at verse 1. In the first year of the Darius administration, you know, in the first year, I, Daniel, observed in the books. He was prime minister. He was a busy government official. God blessed him in the midst of the desolation. He was a man of much responsibility, but he took time to spend time in the book of the Lord. He had a quiet time, some of you call it. I observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah. I was in Jeremiah 25 today, is what he's saying. And I observed what Jeremiah the prophet wrote for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Remember when uh, in 1 Peter, when Peter says that the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, they used to search and make careful search and inquiry into their own writings. No man is above the word of God. And Daniel, great prophet that he was, wasn't at all haughty about it. And he was happy to read Jeremiah's prophecies. And he did. By the way, turn over there. Look at Jeremiah 25 just for a minute. Because he told us where he was looking. <laughs> so we can go there. And Daniel, who was given, by the way, and those of you who've become familiar with your Bible realize Daniel, oh man, he tells the whole scope of the geopolitical scene. God's in charge of the nations. A friend of mine was leaving my house this week, and we just kind of talked about the world condition. And we both agreed it is so good to know the Lord. And I said, read Psalm 2, man. I go back there all the time, you know. Because the nations are in an uproar and they're slaughtering people here and there and burning churches and God isn't threatened. And God is working out his great purpose. And we can have peace in this world. We're going to have tribulation, but take courage. I've overcome the world, Jesus said. Well, anyway, Jeremiah 25. Let me just pick it up at verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, he's speaking to Judah through the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, Judah, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord. I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. That despot? That guy? My servant? You know that these guys that are flaunting their power today, and threatening this and doing that, they're not autonomous. They're under the hand of God. And he raises up creeps at times. In fact, more often than not through history, huh? Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against all that they were going to do to Israel. Yeah. And against all these nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them and make them a whore and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Oh, yeah. That day was coming for Judah. The sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. There'll be no industry. It'll grind to a halt. There'll be no weddings. There'll be no just the joy of life. He's going to take that away. The whole land shall be a desolation and a whore, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Wow. 
God does that sort of thing. And Daniel read about it. Verse 12, Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord. I'll say, remember the handwriting on the wall? Where his knees went slack and he realized he'd just been a pawn. He was flaunting himself as if he was God and he realized, oh, I am in big trouble. For the iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, I will make it an everlasting desolation. And he goes on and says in Jeremiah that he will raise up the Medes. And he did. And Darius, it's in the first year of Darius's reign that Daniel goes to prayer. Nehemiah. Turn over to Nehemiah 9. I just want you to glance there. Look at Nehemiah 9. This is all under this thought. Begin with the word. Your prayer life will blossom under the word. Begin with the word. Daniel did. Nehemiah did. Listen to the first couple verses of Nehemiah um, 9. On the 24th day of this month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dirt upon them. And the descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. While they stood in their place, they gathered together to pray... And while they stood in their place, they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God. They opened the Bible. They read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day. (laughs) A good solid three hours they read the Bible out loud. They began with prayer. Tuesday night, Clayton... Uh, was leading the group as we gathered at 6.30, and he said, I'm gonna, we're going to read Nehemiah 9, all of it. And he said, my wife said to me, all of it? Because it's a pretty long chapter, you know. And then he read us verse 3. If they could read for three hours, we can read all of it. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it was a good time. I don't know if in my life I've ever read Nehemiah 9 out loud in a group like that, but it laid a great foundation for prayer. Jesus in John 17. Oh, Holy Father, I have given them what? Your word. Five times. And he climaxes by saying, sanctify them in the truth, Father. Your word is truth. Begin with prayer. Let me just encourage you. Nothing so prompts real prayer than Real listening. Real prayer is talking with God, conversing with God. Begin by listening to him. Prayer is part of a two-way communion. Uh, Read Daniel 9 aloud. Read Nehemiah 9 aloud. Do what I did this morning. I read John 17 aloud. And it was so good. I had to stumble because my Bible, back when they printed it, they thought it was doing us a favor to change prayer language to Shakespearean for reverence. And in those days, maybe it was, you know, thy, thou, witchest, all that stuff. And John 17 gets hard to read, but Jesus was speaking in normal language. And I don't think we need to say thy and thee and that sort of thing. So anyway, when I read, I translate it, you know, from thy to yours and but it was becoming a tongue twister, but I, I read it aloud to myself. Nobody else was listening. And then it was so good. And uh, I got to verse 23. You don't even need to turn there. Listen to this, because I heard it aloud. That the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. I pray that they would know that you love them like you love me. I stumbled over it. Anyway, I finished. That was verse 23. And uh, it was so good. I said, I think I'm going to do that again. It was early. I still had my first cup of coffee going. And I thought, that'll help me wake up, you know. So I read it aloud again. And with no effort on my part, I was blown away again by verse 23. (laughs) Did I read that right? Stop and think, Christian. He loves you. 
like he loves his beloved son in whom he's well pleased. He sees you in him. If that doesn't prompt praise, I don't know what will. Begin with the word. And that leads me to my second point, because beginning with the word will prompt praise. And here's a tip I want to give you. Second of four. Sometimes praise only. Make that the little earmark of the morning or the evening or the time in prayer. Only praise. No requests. Don't thank him for what he's been doing. Just praise him for who he is. It's a healthy thing. It will change your prayer life. To do that occasionally. To just praise him. Look at Daniel 9, Nehemiah 9. Look what they did. If you're shorthanded, you're thinking, I don't know where to go. Just go to the 145th Psalm and listen to the praise. It's an alphabetic psalm. In other words, he goes A to Z. Only it's in Hebrew, so he, not 26 reasons to praise, but 22 verses of Aleph to Tav. Praise, praise the Lord. And he gives reasons to praise. It's, uh, it's, it prompts us to praise. And sometimes it's good to just praise the Lord. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is good to all. His mercies are over all his works. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Is that something some preacher on Weir Road made up? <laughs> Am I just telling you about my little ideas of God? No, it's in God's word. It's Psalm 145. This is who God is. Stop and just use the 145th Psalm. You know, some of you like to write in your fly leaf of the Bible. And I think that's a good idea sometimes to have some real bases to go to. Well, if you're hurting in your prayer life, just praise only. And uh, maybe make an alphabetic list of reasons to praise him. Characteristics of God. He's holy. He's righteous. He's good. Or just Psalm 145. Or any number of other things. Thirdly, third practical tip. Sometimes, just give thanks only. <laughs> I do that occasionally. And it's always a good time. We do that. Uh, we do both of these, by the way, in the morning prayer time from time to time. Uh, what has he done for you? That's the difference between praise and thanks, by the way. Praise is who he is. Thanks is what he's done. He's created me. He sought me. As soon as Adam and Eve messed up, he came looking for them. And he's been doing that ever since. He seeks and saves the lost. He saved me. He caused me to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Give thanks for what he's done. He died for me. He rose again on my behalf. He's coming back for me. He protects me. He comforts me. He cares for me. He feeds me. But don't let your prayer life, by the way, don't let your thanks life be a meals only. I know. There have been times in my life when you say, if somebody had a little computer clicking on it or whatever and said, uh, how much has Scott prayed the last five days? Well, he prayed for every meal. Oh, I don't want it to be that. But I will say this. Don't make it a meals-only kind of thanksgiving, but do make it a meals-only. <laughs> In the sense that, not only, drop the only off of there. When you have food, give thanks. I, Jesus, there's only one miracle other than the resurrection that's recorded in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. And you know, he also fed 4,000. And both the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, it says very clearly, he gave thanks. When Paul said to the guys on the ship, and they were the sailors, they were the 
rough guys that some of you say, on my crew, it's hard. In my office, my industry, Scott, nobody, you just barely not, you shouldn't do that. Well, that's the kind of group Paul was in on that ship in Acts 27. And he said, hey, we ought to eat. I know you guys are worried. You're so worried you haven't eaten. We ought to eat. And then it says, he gave thanks in the presence of them all to the Lord and ate the food. I think you're never more like Jesus when you're given thanks. Anyway, give thanks uh, for all the things he done. And fourth, fourth, and I'll close with this. Begin with the word. Take some time sometimes just to praise. Kind of learn how. Prime the pump. Sometimes just give thanks. And see what happens to your overall prayer life. And then fourthly, become accountable. I mean, uh, pray outside your closet. Pray with someone else. If you're married... Men, why is it so hard to pray with your wife? Because we're in a spiritual battle. Satan does not want you husbands to open your mouth in the presence of your wife, and pray. And it's hard. Push through that. Pray with your wife. If you're not married, think about finding a buddy or a roommate that you can relate with and pray. Uh, You know, Rick Bork, I would guess 15 or 20 years ago, pastor now back in Michigan but was here as an associate. Many of you remember Rick and many of you have never heard of him. Rick Bork challenged us in prayer, I'd guess 15, 20 years ago. And I've forgotten the context. I think it was at a retreat. But from that, some men started to pray together, kind of buddies. And that was kind of the challenge. And Steve and Roger began to pray before work on Friday mornings. And they'd pray out in Roger's uh, pickup and just outside of Steve's house. And over the years, I'd hear about it, and they continued. And the Tuesday morning, when I went to Tuesday morning uh, this, this week, I don't usually go at 6 over there, but in room 121 where the men gather, uh, that's another group that was started back then when Rick challenged. And guys have been praying every morning or every Tuesday morning at 6 to 6.30. And they have a simple format over here. They read a psalm and pray, one psalm. And I got there this Tuesday when they were on the final, it was a milestone, Psalm 150. And I know for a fact that that's not the first time they've been in Psalm 150. So they've had 150 Tuesdays times about four or five or six or something. It's a long time that those men have been blessed. And you say, how do you get in? I don't know. They keep the door locked. It's amazing to me. I've got a key. How do people find that? But they do, and they come in there. And if you want to know, ask Joel Smith or Steve Bruns or Mark Pearson. And get a, get a, make them give you a key. Anyway, pray and then listen to the door knocking, you know. But it's a great time to pray. Have a, have a partner. And, you know, let me, can I be a little personal here? I, uh, we had a day of prayer probably, I'm guessing, 10, 12 years ago. You know, those national days of prayer, when they call it, it's usually on Thursday. And so we had a prayer meeting over here in the coffee corner, and uh, 6.30, you know, and we got there early, everybody's tired, and uh, we prayed till 7.15, 45 minutes of prayer, and it was a rich time. And when we finished... We looked up, and I'm across the table from Norm Little. And Norm said, we need to do this. And everybody, there was just a handful of us, you know, yeah, yeah, that's good, we should. And he said, no, I'm serious. We need to do this. Well, it's sort of awkward, because I'm the pastor. 
What am I going to say? No, we don't need to pray. It's a national day. We'll pray a national day, but, you know. Every, and so I prayed silently while others were kind of, there was an awkward silence. And then I, I, I said, I'll tell you what, Norm, I'll be back here next Thursday. And we, we came back. And we did it again. And then we did it again. And you know, Thursdays became my favorite day of the week. And the Thursday morning coffee corner prayer was born of just accountability. Just saying, we'll gather again next Thursday. And then next Thursday. And pretty soon we wouldn't miss it. And then we, some years later, had a week of prayer. We said, let's do that every morning for one week. Just have a week of prayer at the start of the year. And it was a great time. Many of you participated in it over there in the foyer. And I remember, I don't know what day of the week it was, but Pete and Jeff both independently came to me and said, this is so good. Why aren't we doing this every week? Well, I may be pastor, but I'm not dumb. I didn't say I'll do it every day forever. You know? I thought about it, and I said, I agree. Would you guys be willing to commit? Somebody, you know, that's every day, 6.30. And that's how the prayer was birthed. And as you know... That's only one of many prayer venues. But I'll tell you what, for me in my personal life, that accountability has made that time with others praying very special, and it's increased my prayer life personally, with my wife, you name it. It's been a blessing. Get accountable in your prayer life. Why not? The burden's on you. I'm going to ask it this way. Why wouldn't you? commit to praying with someone else? Why wouldn't you? Like many of you told me this prayer week, and it's worked every, every year this way, when you pray for a week, you end up saying, this goes on all the time. I could do this again. Why wouldn't you pick a day? If your work schedule doesn't work at 6.30, pick another time, figure it out. But why not? Many of you could come at 6.30 and pray. And if you have to leave at 10 to 7 or 5 after 7 to catch your bus or whatever it is, you can. Nobody keeps track of anything. Uh, but let me encourage you to make a commitment. Why not pick a day? You know, uh, I'm shocked that hundreds of us came out 5.30 Friday for the no excuses. And wasn't that a great time? And I'm not ready to say we should do that every Friday, but I'm just saying commit to praying with others. Let me close where I started. The foundation for prayer is the character of God. The blood will never lose its power. We can praise him because of the cross of Jesus Christ. He's a God of love and forgiveness. He wants to hear from us. He does listen when we pray. It is a spiritual battle. Let me encourage you, maybe today, would be your first real prayer when you realize that he loved you enough to give his son for you and you say, Lord, thank you. I'm a sinner. I want you to be my savior. Let's pray.